Hello everyone, this is uh, Grandmaster Pascal Charbonneau after day one of the Legends of Chess uh, on Chess 24 event. What an exciting day of chess. It's awesome to see these legends of today and of the past uh, get back on the chessboard. People like Vladimir Kramnik, who we haven't seen in a while, uh, had a really good day of chess today, almost uh, came very, very close to uh, you had Jan Nepomniši on the ropes. And then we had a matchup of legends here, uh, Ivanchuk playing against Peter Leko, uh, a great matchup. Uh, it's going to be great to see all these guys face each other, but also see how they do against, you know, Magnus, uh, Magnus, Giri, Nepomniši against the younger guys. So um, the game, the game that I chose as the game of the day was uh, a game between Ivanchuk and Peter Leko. This happened in the fourth round. Uh, Ivanchuk was trailing two to one, and so he had to win with the white pieces against an opponent, Peter Leko, who is known to be pretty solid. And um, so, what what is uh, what is Vasya going to play in this game? Right, you're you're always wondering with Ivanchuk what he might play because he can play literally anything. So, what does he choose? Well, he plays. So he starts with e4 on move one, um, e5, and now he plays f4. So I feel like already once we get here, it almost has to be that this is going to be the game of the day. There's so many reasons. It's it's rare that you see a King's Gambit. Uh, we don't know if it's going to work, but once you see the King's Gambit, you know it's going to be exciting. Um, the opening is not necessarily too popular among some of our commentary team. Jan Gustafsson has... Uh, often said that it is a terrible opening. It weakens the king, among other things, right? And so, um, so of course, he got a chance to uh, to talk trash about it a little bit as the, uh, as the game got going. Uh, and then, of course, we know, you know, Magnus Carlsen has played it in the past against Dingley Ren, for example. And so uh, he always, I think, smiles, uh, smiles when he sees the king gambit. And he did smile at the thought of it when he was doing commentary today, when, when he came on the show to, to discuss, uh, the day's games, I think he was happy to have seen a king's gambit. Um, so the lines that are popular have changed a little bit, you know, over the years. Um, when, uh, when I was younger, I sometimes used to play the king's gambit. Most of the time people would actually play lines with, with D5, you know, ED, E takes F4. Um, only the really well-prepared players would actually play EF and then on knight F3, uh, most of them would play G5. And there were a lot of lines here that start with H4. It gets kind of crazy, right? These positions, knight E5. Um, there's some amount of theory. It's dangerous for black. It was always considered to be okay, though, for, for black. Um, but uh, in, in, in a lot of lines, you know, black returns to pawn kind of happily and just has very active pieces in development, right? So white has kind of weakened themselves forever here. Um, but uh, that's not what Peter Leko does today. Um, after he takes f4, he does take on f4, by the way. There's also other lines, right? Like bishop c5. There's actually a surprising amount of, uh, of possible variations. There's even some fun, funny lines like this with f5. So there's a lot of different things. Uh, it's a fairly rich opening, actually, in terms of, of just the number of variations that lead to quite different positions. Um, but uh, yeah, so Peter Leko plays E takes F4 here. And then uh, after knight F3, he plays H6. Um, Jan Gustafsson is a fan of the move knight F6, which is sort of a, one of the newer ideas. Uh, and the idea is that you actually meet E5 by playing knight H5. It's a little bit of an odd variation, but what you're saying is that white is kind of overextending himself by playing E5, and that black will be able to you know, undermine it by playing possibly uh, D6 later. Uh, and also it cements the pawn in F4, and surprisingly enough, this knight on H5 is not so easy to uh, to get rid of. And it also prevents all these ideas with g3 because it just controls that square. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and if needed, you know, this knight can be defended if it's ever going to get attacked. So um, this is a line that uh, that has been uh, uh, favored by uh, Jan Gustafsson. But in this game, uh, black plays h6. And this is the move by, that uh, Bobby Fischer spoke uh, positively about. Uh, you know, he played the King's Gambit a little bit himself. He was always an E4 player and he did try the King's Gambit. Um, uh, maybe the most famous games was with, the most famous games was with Bishop C4 instead of Knight F3. But H6 was a move that he talked about as being a, a good move because the idea is that Black is sort of preparing to play a G5 as needed, uh, but hopes to do it in, in more favorable circumstances. So now, um, Ivancho plays D4, G5. Black wants to, 
hold on to this pawn. You don't want to let white just win their pawn back and have a very nice center. That's basically the entire justification of the king's gambit right there if you get that. Um, and now Avanchuk plays g3, which is a fairly rare move, although it has been played by none other than our uh, our own uh, Alexander Grischuk in the past. Uh, but it is not the most common move. A lot of other like more sort of normal development moves have been played. G3 does turn it into a real pawn sacrifice, right? You're never going to win your pawn back. You're just saying, I'm going to have some long-term compensation. Um, there was actually a game here that I was going to mention just because it has a really funny idea where black played uh, d6 first, knight c3, pawn takes g3, and here, uh, Yuri Shulman, very strong American grandmaster, doesn't, doesn't play as actively today, but uh, played h4 here with the idea that after uh, g4, you go knight g1, and then you're basically trying to round this pawn up. Um, I can't say that I really believe that it's going to be that amazing, but he has played it a couple times and actually did not so badly. Um, Black can try to take another pawn. It gets, it gets crazy, but this is sort of typical King's Gambit. You ignore... You ignore everything and you just try to try to get a, a, a nice center. Um, but here, Leko first takes on g3. H, H takes g3, seems more or less forced here, uh, and plays bishop g7, which prevents you know the knight takes g5 idea since the rook was hanging. Knight c3, d6, bishop e3. I think these development moves make a lot of sense. And... Um, this is a, a fairly typical King's Gambit, you know, uh, position and structure. White has a very nice looking center. On the other hand, black really hasn't done anything wrong. You know, their position is very, uh, it's very fluid. Uh, their pieces are, you know, going to develop to decent squares. So the question is, does white have enough for the pawn? And they have some compensation. It's a playable game. For Ivanchuk, who's trailing two to one, he's got to be happy with the outcome of the opening here because it's just a messy position. And, you know, in a 15 minute with 10 second increment, a lot of things can happen. So knight f6, queen d2, knight g4, reasonable move. There was actually a, a very similar game. I think it might actually be the same position just with the queen on d3. Uh, between uh, Nigel Short and Luke McChain, where uh, Nigel decided to not not bother with the bishop pair, and they got a position like this. Uh, but McShane did end up winning this game. Uh, position is complicated, not not simple. Uh, but in this game, Ivanchuk, after knight g4, decides to keep the bishop pair, which um, certainly makes some sense. Uh, knight c6, not the only move. It was also interesting to play uh, something like c6 and... Uh, and try to maybe, you know, when white castles, you could try to play for, for, for b5 and play knight d7 instead, you know. Um, so that was another uh, possibility and certainly not unreasonable. Like the knight on d7 can also be helpful in defending the, the king side. So that was also possible. But knight c6 certainly uh, seems okay. Uh, white castles long castles. And now Ivanchuk plays knight to h2, decides that this knight... Um, he doesn't want to live with this knight forever, decides to trade it, uh, which seems like a reasonable a reasonable choice. Knight takes h2, rook takes h2, bishop g4, he's attacking the rook, rook e1, knight e7, bishop g2, queen d7. Uh, in this position, actually, the, and in a few positions, if you look at it with the computer, uh, the computer does like moves that are not not easy for a human to play, but like to play d5 here. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to show, I mean, it's it's uh, it's understandable that a, a human would not necessarily feel like giving this pawn away to then play a move like uh, queen d7 or rook e8 um, would be tempting at all. In fact, it looks, it looks kind of crazy. But the computer likes these uh, these uh, sort of pawn counter sacrifices and thinks that the, the resulting structure is actually good for black. Um, hard to hard to argue against a computer, you know. If you if you uh, I tried playing it out and it does get a pretty decent position, but certainly very difficult uh, to play this. And but you know, I, I whenever I see that the computer kind of changes the evaluation based on a move, I I want to mention it even if it seems completely unfeasible that a human would play. The other thing the computer likes is actually more, a little bit more um, feasible to think that this is, that, that a human would play this because after a uh, pawn takes, pawn takes, queen takes, uh, either rook can take, that position I can actually see a human going for because even though you get, you, you lose your pawn back, position like this, um, 
it's actually reasonable for black. It, black has just returned their pawn, and arguably they have a, a fairly nice end game because um, because their their pawn structure is a little bit better. So that one is actually interesting. So the move c5, trying to force trades, would actually have been a pretty reasonable option. Uh, but Peter Leko decided, you know, why am I giving my pawn back? I, I don't want to do that. I'm playing queen d7. My position is very solid. Um, but now Ivancho comes up with a, a very interesting plan. And, and uh, if I wasn't sure if the King's Gambit was going to be the game of the day, these next couple of moves, I think, uh, changed that for sure. So he plays bishop e3 with the idea that on knight g6, black is trying to improve their position a little bit, maybe play rook e8 next. Um, he plays rook h1. And he's not really disguising what he's trying to do here as after c6, he plays rook takes h6. So he goes for an exchange sacrifice. And this is very interesting. Uh, what does he get for the exchange? Of course, black has no choice but to take it. Well, first, he's likely to win this g5 pawn. Second, the g7 bishop is really sort of the key to de de defending the king's position. Uh, you know, there's a, when you look at the Sicilian dragon, they say that you can never get mated as long as your bishop stays on g7. And so, um, so that concept that the bishop on g7 is a very important defensive piece is is not it's not too surprising, um, and you know really um, I think White just decided that he can't he even though his position looks looks very nice if he doesn't go for an exchange sacrifice or if he doesn't do anything Black will eventually really improve their position right whether it's by playing uh, b5 b4 or just rook e8 and at some point f5 there is you know Black has sort of ways to improve their position while White has a very nice center, but the center is not really going anywhere. So he's got to find something to do. Uh, and so this was a really uh, clever transformation by Ivanchuk. It's not, I wouldn't say that it's better for white or anything. Uh, Peter Leko responds well here, plays king g7, bishop g5, f6, the bishop goes back, and rook h8. So um, generally the side that is up, uh, um, that is up the exchange is happy to trade that, that, uh, that pair of rooks because the, um, you know the, the remaining rook uh, is more likely to shine than the, than the two against one. So b3, the rooks get traded. So we get a position here. It's not like white is about to checkmate black at all. Uh, he's got one pawn for the exchange. He's got two bishops. He's got a slightly safer king. So you know, call it call it about equal. Call it playable. Call it you know three results as pos are possible as uh, Peter Svidler and and many others of course like to say. Uh, I think that's all that's all fair here. Uh, bishop h3, bishop e2, rook e8. So I'm, I want to move forward to kind of uh, a few moves later because this gets it gets really fascinating here. Queen g4. Um, so queen g4 is actually the move that is sort of responsible for for what happens next, uh, the the troubles that he starts to uh, to get himself into. Um, it seems like Black was still more or less okay here, and but but he has to play very carefully uh, and make a move like a6, then play maybe bishop g4, just kind of keep things together without uh, weakening the position. Um, queen g4 is surprisingly risky, and here actually White had sort of an, an amazing resource that uh, that Ivanchuk probably saw but couldn't believe would be good uh, in the move e5 and again I, i'm i like to point out the computer moves because because i know everybody is looking at these games with the computer afterwards and so i i don't want to ignore the truth right even if it's hard to spot but e5 here is really strong uh the idea is to clear the square for e4 and in that sense it's it's possible to to, to look at this move but there's a lot of a lot of sort of possibilities we'll start with the most uh, the easiest ones so queen takes d4 doesn't work here uh, because sorry if uh e5, queen takes d4, we have bishop takes g6, and the queen is hanging. Um, so that leaves various captures on e5, um, and also the move f5. So on d takes e5, let's look at that one. Then knight e4, attacking f6. Not a lot of good moves here. Queen e6 is the one that I thought was most natural, but here white has a really strong move, bishop to g5, with the idea that pawn takes g5, knight takes g5, is forking these pieces. Now that gets really hard to uh, hard to spot in this kind of time control, especially that rook f8 doesn't work because we just take it. Once you're there, you can find this, but it's hard to get there. Um, so e5 was a nice sort of clearing move. 
Uh, it does actually come come to be uh, important later in the game as well. But white plays bishop e3. Very natural move because, um, you know, in, in a lot of lines, the, the this bishop might be hanging on h6. Um, so now black plays uh, b4. And b4 is maybe a mistake because it, there's two problems with it. The knight actually comes to a nice square here on d1 where it can come to f2. That's number one. Number two is this pawn is actually hanging. And it's not just the pawn, it's that uh, with that pawn falling, the queen can get very active, right? Like the pawn on d6 can hang. There's also the idea of playing queen b7 check. So b4 is, is just a little bit of an overextension. Um, of course, he, he played it because he had calculated something, right? So now he takes on g3, which is his sort of logical follow-up. And it's it's a very forgivable mistake because that, now um, Ivanchuk plays queen takes b4, a very, a very, very good move, especially because he had to see that bishop g4 here is actually basically winning a piece, right? He's like threatening the knight. On, whoop, I made a crazy arrow. I apologize for that. Um, he's threatening the knight on d1, which uh, is protecting the bishop on e3. So he's actually you know going to go from up an exchange to potentially up a rook if he wins a piece. And this is where Ivanchuk springs the move e5. And that is just an incredible, an incredible move, and really an incredible position. Um, so what what happens here? So let, let's take a look. Basically, we we can just look at the game because there's not there's not too much there's not too much else that that black can do. So clearly, black. Um, so black plays f5 first. If you play uh, first, bishop takes d1, then queen b7 uh, is pretty is pretty difficult to meet. So if we play king h6, uh, sorry, king h8, I mean. Queen takes e6, we're attacking the rook. And the problem is that a lot of things are actually falling here. Um, the Do you see the the other threat? And this is the, the sneaky one. And maybe this is what uh, Leko missed, but this is a sneaky one, attacking uh, both the bishop and the king. So because of that, because of that threat, there's not, uh, there's not a way to save everything here, right? And so like we play something like rook g8, queen h1, uh, and then we take that that uh, that bishop, and now uh, for an exchange, of course, it's going to be now it's going to be bad for for black because the the king is just unsafe, right? And so, um, uh, yeah, materially white is is equal now, you could say, because they have two pawns for the exchange, but then the relative king safety means that they're probably just about winning. So uh, so Leko plays f five, good try actually. Queen takes d six. And now he takes the knight. So white has a position here where they're not actually winning any material other than pawns. He does have three pawns, right? One, two, three, four, five versus two. So he's got three pawns for a whole rook. But the, the, the number one thing is that the king on b2 is incredibly safe and the king on h7, on h7 is really not. Uh, and white is, of course, only one move away from winning even more pawns. Um, the bishop can't be taken here because uh, there's queen takes g6 and queen h7 mate. So uh, so black plays rook to g8. And now Ivancho calm, calmly plays bishop d2, uh, his bishop just getting out of the way of, uh, of the queen. And I thought this position was amazing because it's just, uh, it seems like black is just lost here. There's not really um, an easy way for them to get out. He could have defended better, uh, which of course in a, in a rapid game, you basically collapse in a position like this. It's very hard to find the most accurate moves. Um, but even with like a computer, computer likes white, thinks white is better. And so I thought this was amazing for Ivanchuk to go for this position, you know, down a rook, uh, needing to win. Uh, and, you know, so, so much in the spirit of the King's Gambit, it seems. So black plays bishop g4. Now that does uh, make white's task a little bit easier. The toughest move was queen h2. You know, again, a very computer-like move. Uh, does a few things. Uh, and white is still much better, right? It can play something like just bishop c3 is probably the, the bishop c3 or bishop b4, depending on where you want the bishop. I think like a bishop c3 is, is the most natural because it this diagonal feels like it could be useful. Uh, and then the game is actually going to go on. White might white might take more pawns, um, and uh, black can try to defend. There's no uh, there's not like a, an immediate blow on either side. Uh, but he plays bishop g4, and now this does this does uh, fail because uh, white plays queen e7 check, exploiting the pin on the knight. 
uh, and he plays rook g7. If you play uh, king h8, there's queen f6, uh, which is very strong because now um, rook, uh, rook g7, you can play either bishop takes g6 or bishop h6, which are just winning. Um, and on king h7, then queen f7 will actually win uh, win a piece like this. And with that, it's going to be made in a couple moves. So, um, so on queen e7, he's got to play rook g7. And now white has the strong move, queen to g5, exploiting this pin. So everything is pinned really for, for black here, uh, not to mention sometimes the threat of queen h6. So here he plays queen h2, which stops queen h6. Bishop takes g4, knight e7. He actually manages to survive. Uh, however, this end game now where white has two bishops uh, and three pawns versus the rook and knight is just, it, it's just lost. Uh, the rest of the game is played really quite well by by Ivanchuk. Uh, he could have done it differently, but this kind of uh, trading the bishop for the knight and thinking that his past pawns are just going to uh, take it home is is very natural. And, and the rest uh, the rest was very clean from from Ivanchuk. He pushes his pawns, um, eliminates the last black pawn to create um, to create three a total of three pass pawns. Uh, eventually, he's going to be able to play like something like King D three and then D five or B seven. So there's not going to be there's not going to be any stopping uh, any stop stopping these pawns. Um, so uh, Peter Leko played King D seven and then after B seven, King C seven, Bishop D six, a nice little finishing touch. Uh, he interposes the bishop and so he makes a queen. So with that, Ivanchuk managed to tie the match, playing the king's gambit, something that made Magnus Carlsen very happy, maybe made Jan Gustafsson a little bit upset. Uh, no, I'm, I'm joking, of course, but uh, but an amazing game, really. And, and it's, it's cool to see a position where you're down a rook, but have enough sort of positional compensation to be uh, better or winning. So... Um, so we're going to be doing a game of the day for, for every day of this Legends of Chess. Um, and I hope you will enjoy them. So I'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for joining me today.